Christ. I am.
intellectual and intellectual leadership despite human prejudice. This is so much the case, and I'm going to pose a challenge to you right now. Find one woman in the Bible who did what was right in God's eyes and who was completely submissive to male culture. She ain't there. <laughs> She ain't there. I mean, think about this. We have two books in the old Bible, Esther and Ruth, named after women. Doesn't happen in the ancient world. In fact, sociologists and anthropologists are scratching their heads about so much in the Bible. Esther and Ruth is one example. In a male-centered world, Esther challenged her husband, who was a king. That could have happened, right? And Ruth and Naomi travel to find their kinsman redeemer, Boaz. And, and, and Ruth initiates romantic overtures, very much outside the standard of it's the man who does the asking. But then you have the Song of Songs woman who has some romantic interests, and she's not going to be quiet about it. They're behaving like people, like human beings. And then there's the Proverbs 31 woman, right? We don't even know about her husband. Her name and her achievements are celebrated in the gates of Jerusalem. So people coming in and saw, it's sort of like, I mean, it's like social media or what used to be newspapers, right? You walk through the city, there she is, the Proverbs 31 woman outstanding leader in Israel, terrific businesswoman. We think of Jael, and we're going to talk about some of these women later. But these women were not only human, but they had such extraordinary courage when you consider what they did. And that's how God introduces women in the next slide, Genesis 2. Now, the only not good in a perfect world and this is straight from the Bible, is Adam's aloneness. Adam cannot really complete the divine commission of tending to the garden without an etzer konegdo in Hebrew, which means a strong rescuer. Now, our English Bibles, mostly run by male translation teams until recently, and I'm happy to say CBE has its own, they translated this amazing Hebrew word as help. It means, it comes from two root words, to be strong and to rescue. This is why we have Esther. This is why we have Ruth. And this is why we have the other women you will meet. Now, they translated it this way, and it's used, this word etzer is used 21 times in the Old Testament, most often for God's rescue of Israel. I lift up my eyes to the hill where my etzer comes, my rescuer, the maker of heaven and earth. Now, that's not to say that women are more divine than men, but God realized for them to complete their work representing God in the world, the two of them had to work together. And this is really what the humanitarians are saying to us today. Unless you have women working beside men in every corner of the world, Unethical practices rise. Productivity goes down. You are needed at the leadership tables in every field. You weren't created to be a subordinate. You were created because your moral rescue is needed in businesses today. Your moral rescue is needed in science and medicine and law in law, because we see things men don't, because we're granular with children. We notice that fallen, crestfallen spirit when our kids walk through the door. We see it first, and we can see when what they're saying isn't quite right. I call that the mama bear glare. But this is the thing that women know for the reasons for which God created us. And we cannot leave ourselves 
in the back room. We're needed at those stages. Not because we're striding and want power and need control, but because we recognize that without us, the projects don't go as well. Yeah. Now, not only, so God says, okay, Adam, alone's bad, need Etzer. What happens next? The animals are created. And he's looking for his etzer, he's naming these animals. Who knows how long that took? You know, 20 years? <laughs> he's looking, he's looking. He's like, I can't find her. <laughs> so he goes to, okay, go to sleep. He rests, the rest we talked about yesterday. He rests, and she is taken out of his side because, and, and, and when he wakes up and meets her and says, ooh, I like your hair. <laughs> he wakes up and he sees her, and it's the first human words in the Bible. The first human words we have in the Bible in Genesis. At last, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. I'll call you woman because you're from me. And it is a de declaration of their unity, their oneness of substance created in God's image for moral decision making and created from his body to share that one flesh relationship of marriage and to work beside him in the garden. If you go to Christian, uh, you look for a good Christian book, it's always about marriage and these sorts of things. Often they talk about our differences but the Bible celebrates their similarities, their oneness of substance, because they have one project together to govern the world in God, as God's representatives. Amen. And this is so beautiful. And you wonder why it didn't last. Adam and Eve rebel against God. Each of them make a distinct decision on their own that they will eat of that one thing in a world of total bliss and total provision. There's just one thing they can't do, and then they do it. They were deceived. Eve was deceived by the serpent. And this, and Adam made a bad choice. And this rebellion creates a disharmony and a rupture in their relationship with God, one another, themselves and the rest of the garden. It is a chaos that sets in, and God says, woman, your desire will be for your man, and he will rule over you. And the tragic thing, in my opinion, about this is that in a fallen world, the one we live in now, this dominance, which some churches say is biblical, it's part of the sin, it wasn't God's recommendation. It wasn't the way they lived in a perfect world. It is part of the fallen world, which Jesus came to upend. But when we think of it as the norm, what does that do? When we say it's how it should be, we are diminishing a woman, women created in God's image. What slander that is. She was created in God's image for shared governance. It, it kind of puts a cloak over woman, what she's supposed to be. And the second that happens, in the very same uh, chapter, a verse later, God said, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to send a redeemer. And the woman will bear the child, the Christ. It's the Holy Spirit and a woman. And as Sojourner Truth, man ain't have nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay, Sojourner. Man ain't had nothing to do. What was lost through Eve was supremely provided through the Holy Spirit and Mary. And it's such a beautiful truth. So despite their sin, God redeems humanity. Christ will come through a woman. She will bear the child, and he will crush 
evil. And this, this uh, Christ will crush the serpent's head and woman will be free once again. If we go to the next slide, we have a quick peek at the ways in which women operated and navigated through a male dominant world. Prophets, women were prophets, right? And despite male rule in a fallen world, we have the strongest leadership possible in the Old Testament. Now, why prophets? Because priests spoke and pleaded on behalf of the people to God, but prophets declared God's moral decisions through them to the priests and the king. So the highest ranking people, if you look at it that way, were really the prophets. They keep the church on track, and the people of Israel, they're the moral voice, and women were prophets. So if you turn to the next slide, we have Huldah, right? She was a prophet uh, at the time of Jeremiah and Zephaniah, two prophets. But when the book of the law, piece of the law was found, Josiah, the king Josiah and his team go to Huldah. No one knows why. But they go to Huldah and they say, Huldah, what should we do with this? And Huldah says, obey it. And as a result, her prophetic leadership of Israel led to the greatest revival in Israel's history, one that lasted about 100 years. We have Miriam, right? And there she is with her tambourine. Don't you love the dancing that they did? She's called a leader and a prophet. Israel would not travel without her. And Deborah, it, it's known that Israel wouldn't go into battle without her. Barak wanted to lead this war, but they're like, no, 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 no. Deborah, send her out. Deborah led the troops and comforted Israel. She was a judge, too. She seated in her judge seat under the palm tree. She adjudicated the highest, most complicated uh, debates in Israel, and she's called the mother of Israel. So in many ways, she's the highest ranking woman in Israel of the day. And in the next slide, we meet women exer strong rescuers outside of Israel. Jael was married to a man who was not a member of the tribe. And remember, she invited Sisera into her tent. Oh, you're tired. Here's a little milk. When he fell asleep, she killed him to prevent many more deaths. He was determined to create a, a genocide. And we have the two he, Egyptian midwives, Shifra and Pua, right? And they were told by their king, do not rescue these Israel babies. And they did it anyway. Right? And Rahab the Amorite, who meets the spies coming into her community, the Israeli spies, and, they, and she said, look, I will hide you and protect you, but you save my family. And so she, she negotiates with them, and she wins, and she's mentioned in the bloodline of Jesus. Yeah. Now, these women... And many more, as you'll see in the next slide, were not helpers. They were at the front of the conflict, leading the wise decisions that needed to be made. They had courage, chutzpah, and they were gifted by God as strong etzers. We have Shira, who built one of the best cities, three cities actually in her day, most important cities in Israel. And we have these other women that we've mentioned, so we'll keep going to the New Testament. Women loved Jesus. They loved him. It, it, he treated them like they were human beings, yeah. as if they had important, you know, general-like decisions to make. He recognized their demeaning, and he challenged it. He was the great feminist from antiquity, if you want to put it that way. But remember, feminism can, is a biblical word. So he's, he's waiting, right, in the heat of the day. He's, his disciples are like, we're going to Samaria? Isn't that like where the, those people live? And he's like, well, you go buy food. And he's just sitting there waiting for her. She'll be here. I know she will. She comes when no one else comes. She's got some shame she's dealing with. 
She's been put down. She doesn't know how to fight. She shows up, right? At, at the well, Jacob built. These two, this is a woman that Jesus holds the longest conversation with anyone in the New Testament. He's talking to her. He tells her all about herself as the movie pulls out so well. And she says, are you a prophet? And he utters those words that any Jew or Samaritan would recognize. He says, I'm the I am. Right about then, the disciples show up, and why they're astonished. He is telling her his identity and not them. And what does she do? And this movie, oh, she throws her jar, she dances, she goes back to her village and leads this hated tribe into the Jesus tribe. Hated tribe becomes the Jesus tribe. She's the first evangelist, and frankly, she's one of the most successful. And Jesus picked her, lowly and outcast as she was. He's on the hunt for her. And that's who he is for me. Let's go to the next slide. Here we have the Syrophoenician woman. She um, heard about the miracles. And she's mama bear. She wants her daughter healed. She's a mama bear. So she crashes a party. That takes guts, right? The Pharisees are holding this party, and here's someone uninvited walks in. And the disciples are embarrassed. And the Greek text suggests they're, she's trying to not get out of here. They're kind of, you know, body languaging her out. But she's fierce. She's going to stay there. And she begs Jesus for healing. Now, it's hurtful because Jesus said, should I give the bread that is intended for the Israelites to the dogs? And that's pretty humiliating. Now, why dogs? Well, the Israelites viewed her people, and they're up in Lebanon, north, where is Syria today, as dogs, undeserving of the gifts of God. Undeserving. He knew she was going to be there. In a few chapters earlier, the disciples had no idea how Jesus was going to feed 5,000 with just a few crumbs. But this woman knew. She said, the dogs eat the crumbs under the table. Boom, right over the bar. She flies right over it. And that's the point. You would not expect a dog, a woman of the dogs, to have that kind of faith. Greater faith than the disciples. Andrew says, can we feed all these people with five few fish and loaves? And this woman said, I will be fed and my daughter will be healed. And she was healed. Amen.